And anyone that runs a business understands the amount of friction that they have when they, for payment processing, chargebacks. That's right. Sure, because payment failure. That alone is like in the hundreds and billions of dollars of friction. This friction cannot go away until and unless you use crypto. Stripe has built a super successful business to facilitate you know, payments API and make that backend of payment rails faster, better, cheaper. They've been very successful at it. There's one area where they haven't been able to crack. And it's it's this idea of, of, of using the traditional financial rails. It's very expensive. It's an antiquated patchwork. They came to this realization, I'm convinced. Scale is the blockchain that is simply built different. Other L1 networks have costly transaction fees, clunky user experiences, and lack true adoption in AI and on-chain gaming. Explore the gas-free ecosystem at scale.space slash ecosystem and follow their journey on X at Scale Network. That is Scale with a K. Hit the link in the show notes to get started. Let's face it, building on crowded L1s or expensive L2s is just not going to unlock the next generation of applications. Super Containers offers dedicated, customizable app spaces running on Supra's 500 KTPS Layer 1 blockchain, giving you complete control over gas tokens and fees. Get notified when Super Containers are ready for builders at supra.com slash containers. Want more from Empire? Subscribe to the Empire newsletter for daily insights, news, and data from every segment of crypto. Empire is your must-read morning newsletter. We track the major narratives driving crypto and complement the news with data. You'll receive a breakdown delivered to your inbox every weekday morning so you can stay up to date in our fast-paced industry. Head to the registration link in today's show notes or go to blockworks.co, join readers from all corners of crypto, and sign up for the Empire Newsletter today. And we're live. What's up, Santi? How much? How's it going, sir? Good. What's going uh, on? You, five minutes ago, you were late five minutes ago, but I, I, I will allow you to be late because you announced an acquisition. Let's just ride right into it. Tell us more yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we just acquired the, the drop. Um, the drop is was started by this guy, Gannon Breslin. They launched... Uh, about three and a half years ago. So we want we we identified this like gap in our coverage, which was more like gaming, culture, memes, NFTs. Like we're very um we have a lot of really good technical shows and technical newsletters, like Xerox Research and Bell Curve. And we talk about like, I don't know, kind of the infrastructure side of crypto a lot. We've also got really good institutional coverage. So like on the margin, forward guidance. Um, but we're missing this area of crypto that is super interesting, which is like the culture, the memes, the on-chain art, the like gaming. Um, we're recording tomorrow with uh, Off the Grid guys, uh, the game on Avalanche. Like it's a really like it's a it's a it's a there are two missing gaps for us in coverage. One I think is uh, Bitcoin. So like this whole Bitcoin renaissance, like Bitcoin L2, is that's a missing area. The other missing area is what I just mentioned, which is like gaming and memes and all that kind of stuff. So. Whenever you see something missing, I think there should always be at any company, it's like a build versus buy conversation. Or first it's like, okay, well, should we do this or should we let someone else do it? So for this, we decided we actually need to do it. Then it becomes a build versus buy. So do we just build this in-house and start a newsletter and a podcast and stuff from scratch? Uh, it perfectly aligned with, I've known Gannon for years. Um, he... Uh, we started talking about this acquisition. So we've been talking about it for several months and it just kind of the deal terms lined up and what we think we can do with it lines up. And he wanted to, he actually took it to market and was talking to a few other folks, but he was really adamant that he didn't want the buyer to shut it down. He wanted the buyer to 10 X the, he, re he really loves the brand and the community. You know, there's 20,000 like diehard on-chain people there. So yeah, he just didn't, there were some buyers who, um, I think probably would have paid more than us, but uh, would have probably shut down the brand as well. So um, that's interesting. Do you yeah. think that uh, putting yourself in the shoes of the acquired was it your distribution? Was it the fact that uh, you know you're a great person? Like, what was it that really clicked? For yeah, you? I mean, 
I mean, he talked a lot about like, we have a real, so one thing that was important to him is we're still a founder led company. I think another thing that's important to him is um, we have a real like passion for just Blockworks. Like, like Blockworks is Mike and my baby. And um, he, you know, he talked like, I, I don't know if you ever, if you li- went back and listened to the Antonio episode that mm-hmm. I recorded with him, but like all about just being a founder, it's like you, when you build a company, like you're so intertwined with it. Like it is your child in a sense. And he's like, look, this is my baby. Like the 20,000 people who are subscribed to this newsletter, I think there's like 25 or 26,000. He's like, I know them individually. Like I onboard them. Like I meet them. Like these are my people and I don't want to just uh, maybe sell it to a crypto exchange who's going to turn it into like the Binance newsletter. And like, boom, yeah. we just added 26,000 subscribers. So, so yeah, I'm so felt sufficiently comfortable that you were going to preserve his brand, his identity, whilst also morphing into a very good platform and just be a springboard for him to continue to execute while abstracting away a lot of the things that he doesn't want to deal on day to day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's he's stepping down. Like he 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 has a vision to go do some other stuff as well. And so this yeah, this allowed him to so unlike the acquisition of the breakdown. So when we acquired the breakdown, Nathaniel Whitmore has yeah. stayed on. Like he's still for people who listen to that show, um he's stayed on, he still writes his newsletter. Um but Gannon is going to step away and we've got a whole like kind of infrastructure to we're going to pause it for a little bit and then start getting the the newsletter out there five days a week. So, yeah. yeah. So how much of this was um, your, as an organization, I think about obviously being relevant and covering what is happening in crypto. How much of it was you were seeing this opportunity of a lot of interest on meme coins, uh, you know, and, and that being a big part of the thesis or was it just tapping into a community, an audience that you just haven't cracked into? But again, it goes back to inverting, like people want to hear about meme coins. It's an important category as NFTs were back in the day. Yeah, um, all of that is kind of right. So the way that we think about building media companies is very different than I think how other people think about it. So let's say if you're Coindesk, right? You're like, how do you scale something like Coindesk? You just make Coindesk bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but in but my my humble opinion, which I you know I don't know if I'm right or wrong, or I don't know if Mike Mike is right or wrong, but we believe that the way to scale a media company is by scaling brands not by scaling one singular brand. So Blockworks sits here, but we actually have this house of brands model where each brand like Empire or Lightspeed or Xerox Research is built around a diehard community in crypto. So that's, mm-hmm. the, that's the whole thesis that we, that we have for the building the business. There's a new community that's popped up, which are, yeah, it's like, it's the meme coin people. Um, yeah. It's just this like, yeah, it's the meme coin people basically. And so you can either laugh at it um, and like not take it seriously, or you can say, who am I to say that this is not a serious thing? Like this is just the way the world works. Um, and this is a diehard community. So yeah, if it, if it wasn't meme coins, let's say it was a digital art boom, you'd say there's an obvious community here, but because it's meme coins, it kind of gets laughed at a little bit. So yeah, that's, um, that was one of the theses. That's great, man. Yeah. Very excited for you guys. Obviously it's an investment block works. Get all fired up when you guys just go on the it's offensive. Good. It's great to see this. So yeah, it's obviously uh, I flipped this. I flipped on meme coins last year. I was very critical of them, and then you know I was just on a call with a couple of fund managers over, over this week, and they're all thinking about it. Yeah, they're all should we hold it in our portfolio? Like a lot of LPs are wondering that too, and like why is it any different? Like you know why why shouldn't you be allowed to? What is so fundamentally wrong about meme coins? And I think it's they've had product market fit for so many years, like Doge and Sheeb, and now the whole, you know, new category of them. And it's if you're in crypto, whether you like it or not, this is one of the more important categories. And I don't want to go into why we've covered, but it's there. And to your point around as a media organization, I think, you know, be dumb not to cover it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's, uh, let's pivot that into talking about goat. So <laughs> round up last week, um, you know, you start talking about this, this, this goat coin and, uh, on bananas, where was that? That was probably what it was trading at. Yeah. Two, roughly three. like 
Two hundred. Yeah, I'm gonna use cents because I have a small yeah. brain here. So I'm gonna r- roughly thirty cents. It's now trading at eighty cents. So yeah. I mean, every every day I, I open the charts, it's up another you know twenty to sixty percent on the day. Was, so was, to be fair, it was down a lot over the weekend because the the terminal the truth terminal which is this account that it's tweeting out of made a misspelling mistake. It tweeted group uh, and inverted the O and the U. And there was uh, people in the timeline saying, oh, I've never seen an AI. I've never seen like ChatGPT make a mistake. There is clearly something wrong here. They sort of suggested that Andy, who is like the developer here, was behind it and it wasn't an AI and it was all like LARPing yeah. as an AI. So then it went down pretty aggressively, fifty percent, like a to to twenty cents. I think it went. Did down you hold? 18, Eighteen cents. Yeah, I haven't sold a thing. Um, well, I only sold a very small position for like what seemed like a um, a clone, a sister that wasn't being endorsed by this. It was like she or something like this. And then I w- went back to goat. Um, hmm. So no, I haven't sold. I think it's a very fascinating experiment. It obviously carries a ton, ton of risk. I'm not endorsing it. Uh, just you know, people should still do their own research. But I'll tell you why I like it if you're interested, or they can just go listen to the prior episode. Give me the give me the quick synopsis. It is a pretty fascinating view into what a world might look like with AI agents on chain and being empowered with capital. Hmm. And I think there's a lot of knowledge that we might be able to infer by what the, it decides to do or not by the way it got a grant it did not launch the coin it just kind of bought a position in it and people you know it sort of made it its own in in some respects yeah. it's become it's, it's become co-opted the coin. it's yeah, co-opted it's, the coin. yeah it's become the cult leader of 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 this this meme right and i think um yeah, like it's one of the more interesting things. So, so like as a category, I, I think it's just like very differentiated from the whole host of other meme coins that are like, you know, animal coins. That's a very competitive category. This feels very differentiated. Um, and and so I'm paying attention for that reason. Like how how might you influence this? Like, you know, how, how does it interpret, um, you know, people have tried to scam it and it picks up on it. People have tried to get its attention to focus on other derivatives of, of the, you know, a, this goat type coins. And it's just sort of very interesting to observe it in real time. What it, what it does do and what it does not do as well. You know, it's also tweeted or intimated that like, I think it's already a millionaire. It's already made a million dollars. And it's like, it has one tweet, which was pretty epic. It's like, Oh, I just want to go retire in a farm or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So what happens if 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 this AI agent decides to dump all the tokens and like you know move on to something else or buy another meme coin or it's a wild experiment? It has a I could see like so many different outcomes in the range of possibilities. So <laughs> I'm just excited to follow it as an experiment. Yeah, it's interesting. So Brian Armstrong has started tweeting at it, talking about like giving it its own wallet and uh just yeah very very yeah, interesting the the, the, very, the meta is like it decided so i was on another podcast talking about like solana versus ETH and yada yada and meme coins and all this stuff i'm like listen we're all humans here you know doing our own analysis but can we find it very interesting that mark andreessen gave 50k grant to this ai bot and the first thing that it decided to do out of all the range of possibilities it decided that the most productive use of its resources and capital was to go and <laughs> choose Solana and choose this particular meme coin, buy it and make it its own. Like that alone is like pretty mind blowing. What do you do what here? Do what what huh? do you do here? What do you do here? This thing's at this thing's. I'm up a I lot. Mean, <laughs> It's up a lot, yeah. It's I mean we're we're closing in. I think it's at what eight hundred million FDV, closing in on a billion, like going up twenty to fifty percent a day. Um, you're you're up a lot on it. What what do you do in a situation like this? I'm not touching it for now. How just, will you make uh, a decision on when to touch it? 
Like, is um, it a gut feel? Do you see something on Twitter? You're like, ooh, this feels like it's changing. Is it? Uh, I'm. I think it's impossible to trade for me at least to trade these things any asset in the near term. Uh, my thesis again. I remind myself of the thesis for the cycle. Like, I am still bullish. I think next year. Uh, regardless of the election outcome, but I, if polls are right, obviously if Trump wins, it's far better. But regardless of the outcome, we get a relief rally. I still believe we're in a bull market. Like structurally, I like crypto. I'm not looking to sell here. I think next year will be good. I feel good about it. Um, so I want to be, I want to be riding the fastest horses, and I think yeah. those are Solana for me. I think very clearly, I see a lot of activity happening in Solana, um, and I'm excited about the projects there. Uh, and I think it's the fastest horse. And then I like memes. It's a very proven category. I like them because they are levered bets on a particular ecosystem with ample liquidity it becomes super important to be able to punch out of positions with liquidity. NFTs didn't have that. Some of the other tokens don't have that. Memes don't have that problem. And it's um, it's a very proven category. And I just think that I want to be long meme coins and I, I want to be long, like blue chip meme coins. Um, yeah. And so, for instance, when you think about like, I think some of the more interesting categories, uh, obviously what's happening in Solana, but like deep and is super exciting. I think AI will continue to do well as a category. Um, you sort of saw it with Tao and Akash and some of these coins. This is kind of the combination of memes with AI. And I think mm -hmm. for me, that's like in a, in a scenario where say the base asset, I think it outperforms Sol is sort of the TLDR. And that's why I hold it. It carries way more risk, but I'm comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I have underwritten that most of these meme coins at any given point in time will have like s severe drawdowns. Um, we've had that from 5 billion to a billion uh doe just had that cheap has had that and then they sort of rebound and they those are the memes that i am more interested in spx kind of has gone through in this evolution right now and it's kind of shown some strength recently but yeah they're they're like the way i see it is they enhance the return that i think i'm going to get on something like solana yeah yeah what do you if you had to pick three memes right now not financial advice all that kind of stuff is it just with goat and yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, a cheat. I'll cheat. I'll give you four. Um, and by the way, none of this financial advice. Do your own fucking work. Maybe don't need to invest in these lottery tickets. But anyways, um, that out of the way. Uh, Whiff, I've been vocal about it. I have, I have position on all these, by the way, and, and others. But Whiff I like because I think it's a dominant do dog coin in Solana. Uh, you could argue it's Bonk, but Bonk structurally has unlocks and sell pressure. I think Whiff is more organic and it's a cuter dog picture. Um, so I like it for that reason. I think it can become the Sheeb of Solana. So like Sheeb is like the dominant dog coin in Ethereum. I think Wave can do that for Solana. And you know, you know, Sheeb for instance was uh, 18 billion fully diluted. I think at the peak it was much higher than that. Wave right now is sitting at two and two point five, two and a half billion. So you know, I see a, a path potentially. Solana does well. I think Wave does well and outperforms. Uh, again, levered bet on Solana without the risk of being liquidated. And with very well, a ton of liquidity on chain and off chain, um, so wave number one. I also believe in this um, cat to dog uh, compression, like conversions. Uh, even though I don't particularly <laughs> love cats, I love I love dogs. But I'm also a professional investor. I guess you could argue that I'm not a professional investor because I'm talking about animal coins. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm making a fool of myself. Um, Pop cat, I think, is interesting uh, as again one of the the dominant. Uh, meme the dominant cat coin in solana structurally long solana structurally uh, long memes in solana because it's a very retail phenomenon so pop cat would be for that reason it's like at a billion now a billion and a half oh so my God. I, I think it's um yeah that the convergence of dog dog does well cat is going to do well it probably does better because it should convert <laughs> seriously uh, there's equally, there, there, I there's love. I, I'm I'm pitch, uh, So yesterday, Santi pitched me the thing that he's building, and it was like it was actually one of the most professional like decks I've ever seen. Very buttoned up, very professional pitch, and I'm imagining 
<laughs> like I'm imagining you go pitch like I'm, you know, I'm seriously I'm, I'm seriously I'm seriously not, not gonna raise any money for the private equity fund. People like, be like, wait a minute, man. Wait a minute, bro. You're like, you know, it, it's like such a clean deck, and I'm imagining you. You know, I know you're pitching some of these like you know endowments and pensions and some of these big names for a suit and tie and stuff like that, and then they're like, all right, let's uh, do this. Hopefully, um, the sovereign wealth fund of you know Singapore, Temasek, or some of these sovereign wealth funds are not listening to this podcast. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> like, like, but like, hey, uh, yeah. hey, Anna, can you go do some due diligence on this uh, Santiago guy? Because he, you know, he didn't put his picture on the on the deck. He put this like this animated little avatar thing. Uh, he said it's like it's a, a punk, punk or something. Punk thing yeah. Was. Anyways, yeah. listen. The same type of doubt. To be fair, like when I was doing um, investment banking at J.P. Morgan, I did a lot of like veterinary clinics and like dog, pet food companies. Massive private equity funds would like do these roll ups of veterinary clinics. They would give you the pitch decks of like. The data is really compelling. People love their pets. That's why. Yeah. Seriously, the the analysis, you can laugh all day long about memes. The analysis is structurally fundamentally the same. Dogs, pets, people have a very strong affiliation for pets. They're more lonely. Pets become, literally, they spend almost the same amount of money uh, uh, that they spend with their kids. Most of the time, like half of pet owners, the pet sleeps with them. Like, you know, and so anyways, um, I, I think there's there's like some... You could do some serious analysis of meme coins, I'm saying. The yeah. third meme that I like is obviously GOAT. I think it's the riskiest of them all. Like this could be a flash in the pan kind of scenario. A GOAT is at 800 million, 700 million right now, fully diluted. Um, the bot can go crazy. It could sell. It could. There's so many things that could go wrong here. But uh, I see a very interesting fan of returns. It's just very differentiated. AI is going to continue to be a very memeable category. And this could be, I could see this run up dramatically or go to zero. <laughs> but that fan appearance is interesting. It's just a very interesting experiment. I want to own it because I'm, I want to pay attention. Um, the maybe fourth category, the, the fourth one that I will endorse, by the way, I own all of these is SPX. Uh, Murad. Uh, yeah, this is Murad's coin. I still think it has interesting... I think it's an interesting property in the sense that it's like when you think about I, I did a survey the other week, which was okay, and I'll ask you this. Maybe I'll ask you this because I'll stop talking. So imagine a hundred users enter crypto. They load up their wallet. What do they buy first? Bitcoin? Majors like so Bitcoin, a major like Solana, ETH, SUI or whatever, Aptos, Cardano. Do they buy memes or do they buy something else or an NFT? What do they buy? What are they buying first? The Pick very one. first thing they buy. I think the very first thing they buy is probably Bitcoin or ETH. Actually, I know. I know that's not what you're looking for. I think the very no, first no. thing they buy. Here's here's what I actually think. Like I'm, I'm I'm picturing like a college friend of mine or like a high school friend of mine who like still doesn't own it. Okay, actually, probably a lot of them already own Bitcoin and ETH, but they haven't looked at their crypto portfolio in in, month, in years, probably. Then the market's going to rip. Bitcoin's going to hit 100K. They're going to see it on CNBC. They're going to be like, oh, shit. All right, this crypto thing's real again. Okay. Um, they're going to be like, okay, I probably they're probably going to buy Solana, I would guess, first. Um, they'll be like, okay, it looks like the Solana thing's ripping. Like, I, I hadn't heard of it last cycle. Like, let me, let me buy that. Then I would guess... I mean, the unfortunate thing is I think they skip all of the DeFi tokens, other L1s. Like mm -hmm. if you're just a new person coming in, yeah, I mean, maybe they buy memes. Maybe. Most survey respondents said they go direct to memes. Second one was like Bitcoin and Ethereum. I don't, why do they go direct to memes though? Why do they just buy SPX well, 6900? It's financial nihilism. Yeah. That's what it, I mean. Look, it's, it's, uh, it's like moon to dust mentality. Moon or dust mentality. It's uh, for the same reason people like to punt stuff like biotech stocks or GameStop. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's people don't don't are not, are not interested in assets to give you eight percent compounding. You know they're not buying Coca Cola. Stock. It's same with uh, you know same with I have a lot of friends who do sports sports betting. Like yeah, they're nice. not they're not they're either actually betting. They're you're doing either, like a crazy parlay, but you're not betting on the on the two X outcome. <laughs> well, they're either just betting on the game, like just the normal, the normal, which is like I guess you'd call it the dust, or they're the moon, right? They're doing like seven team yeah, parlays, yeah. like just ri ridiculousness. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and I mean, lo lottery is a very proven category. 
memes are lottery tickets with emotional cachet and positive EV because they provide entertainment value. Yeah. They really um, do. They're, and so the, the, the reason why I like just to round out this discussion on SPX is it's quite differentiated. Most people understand the S&P 500. It's a very solid brand. And most people structurally can't invest in the S&P 500 through their normal portfolio. If you're not in the U.S., it's very hard to get exposure to the U.S. market. So this could become, in the most wild upside scenario, this becomes like the proxy to, you know, you sort of become the proxy tokenized stock for the S&P 500. And then it's like, how, how high can it go? You know, and it's it's like you either also make fun of the uh, traditional markets. There's some element of that, some mockery of that. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of, yeah, it's... Uh, what I what I would look at uh, just to offer, by the way, th these are I may change my mind, might sell these positions, so just bear in mind. You know, don't don't listen to anything I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. The thing that I will pay, just I'll dispense some advice, I like guess, useful advice for people is, um, look at things that, and I tweeted about this the other day. It was like you ought to look at projects that have a severe drawdown, and then bounce back. And I think the, pay attention to that because if the team, in this case, memes don't have like visible teams, but if the community didn't leave, they didn't go to another meme coin. If it's, if it's able to preserve and capture, retain that attention through a very severe drawdown. And these meme coins, by the way, have them on the daily, right? Then that's a really strong signal of, yeah. of the potential of the, you know, so anyways, the, the, these, by the way, these three, Whiff has had the drawdown, Popcat has had the drawdown, um, Goat has had, you could argue, a drawdown over the weekend, and, you know, SPX has had some drawdown, yeah. Not a full one. Not, not, I don't know if I'd call this chart a drawdown, but yeah. No, 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 no. no. So, I mean, it, it went from, <laughs> basically, it went from... Like uh, do, what is it? It reached almost the, what was the high? You go down, yeah. So it, the the all time high was ninety cents, and I think it it the, it went all the way down to fifty cents. So it was a pretty severe drawdown. Yeah. I mean, it was a pretty decent drawdown, I'd say. Yeah. Um. Okay. The last thing I will say on this is uh, there's something that uh, George, both George Soros and Stanley Druckenmiller talk about. I think uh, Soros. Uh, so the way Soros puts it is invest and then invest, invest and then investigate. Druckenmiller is buy first, analyze later. And um, I just want to read this because I think it's uh, I think it actually really applies to to meme coins and some other things that will come this cycle. Um, and it's a good, it's actually good. It, it's it's different than how I think most people think about investing. Um, but look, Druckenmiller and Soros, two of the greats. So Druckenmiller says, I don't know who I heard a saying with anal analysis comes paralysis. Or a source used to say, invest and then investigate. But it's more important now even than it was then. We're in a, such a fast-moving world with the, all the new communications that if I get an idea and I think it's attractive and for whatever reason the security price will be higher in a year or two, I generally go ahead and buy it and then I tell the analyst to look at, at it. And if it turns out I was wrong, after they analyze it, I get out. I don't like to wait around. A lot of my best ideas, I'm not that smart. Um, so if I see it, whatever's going on to cause that idea to happen, someone else might see it. And by the time we get done analyzing, I might miss the 30 or 40% move, and then I'm paralyzed. This has happened to me all the times with these memes. And then I'm paralyzed because it just went up 30 or 40%, and I don't have the guts to buy it, even if I think it's going higher. So we're more in the camp of if we get a strong feeling, we cut the analysis, and then by all means, do our analysis thoroughly, and then just unload it if it turns out my thesis wrong was wrong. So I think that's a really sound... This, this be the most useful framework that I apply now. Yeah. You yeah. want to get you want to get paid. It all comes down to sizing a position, but you don't have any exposure psychologically, you're going to be in a really bad spot because you want to get paid when you're right. Yeah. And the worst is not getting paid when you're right, meaning you told all these people. So I'll, I'll tell you in a story. There's this particular individual that came to me during token 2049 and said, SBX. He went and reached out to Murad. He talked to him. He came to me, gave me the skinny on why SBX. That day, I bought some. Without, look, just I bought some. I'm like, I want to pay attention. I'm going to buy some. And then I did more work. I talked to him weeks later and I say, hey, by the way, you know, thank you very much. You know, really appreciate the, the tip here. 
And I was like, I'm sure you've done very well for yourself. He's like, I didn't buy anything. I'm like, what? He's like, I was going to do a report and then publish it, but it's run up so much. I can't, I can't get around the fact I can't buy it now. And I was like, okay, you are just in a bad spot. You're totally paralyzed. Yeah. Weeks later, same person pings me about go at like 40 million fully diluted. He's like, look at this. Sue that saw the skinny, you know, heard it from him yep. and bought. He bought, he sized it too. And I'm so happy for him because he now he's like, I've learned from that mistake. And I yeah. bought and it, and now is con, like he's I get all my intel from him in the sense like he's constantly paying attention and Andy tweets and he's in the trenches, he's doing the work. And I just think like, you know, I'm I'm so happy to see that because he corrected that mistake. And look, goat might go to zero. But I think still the process was good. Like he was, and and he sized it up more. Like I have throughout. You want to keep backing a fast horse. Like Soros and Drunken Miller talk about this too. Buy momentum. And I think yeah. if you're in a bull market, you want to back the fastest horse. You don't want to buy a broken bird. You know that shit. That's that's not where you're going for, right? Um, yeah. You have to be mindful. Of course, timing becomes an important element. But that's why again the piece of liquidity is so so important. Soros was able to make a billion dollars because he shorted the pound and you could come in and out of that with size. And I think there was an instance where Soros went to his, uh, or was it Drunken Miller went to Soros? Because Drunken Miller used to work for Soros. Drunken Miller went to Soros here. Yeah. And Drunken Miller, he talks about in some of his po- in videos, like go and watch every single YouTube that Drunken Miller and Soros have. You'll become a better investor. I did it. I, I don't know if I'm a better investor, but I learned a lot. Um, but um I think Drunken Mill went to Soros with a really good idea. Soros got behind it fairly quickly. And Drunken Mill suggested, yeah, we should size it at like 5% of the fund. He's like, what are you talking about? If th- this is a great idea. Like go 40% of the fund. Like go. <laughs> and it was just like, okay. Like Tepper does this too from. Yeah. Went really big on China like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, good ideas don't come every so often. And I think you have to. It's unfair to say that you're not going to like size it at 40. You're going to size go like no one, like 40% of their portfolio day one. But if you're seeing strength, you buy it at 50, you buy it at 100, you buy it at 75. It goes down, you buy it at 200, you go to 300. You you keep buying strength, right? You know, you yeah. take profit, you do all this stuff, but like, yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I, I like, I know this. I know that. So I, I missed SPX, which kills me because I actually have a long connection with Murad. Um, I, Murad, so I, we used to run the pump podcast back. It used to be called off the chain. Yeah. yeah. And, um, there was this episode that we did in October of 2018. And if you look at this medium post, Murad, the ultimate Bitcoin argument on pump Substack, with like the whole transcript of the thing, I, I posted this, this was me on pumps Substack or on pumps. I guess we did, there wasn't Substack back then it was medium. And this, this episode was the best episode we had ever done. And it was to to this day, one of the best Bitcoin episodes ever, I think. And so I see Murad start posting in like August about these memes. Yeah, whatever. And then he starts posting at the end of August and like really early in September about SPX. It was a $10 million market cap. And I was like, oh my God, this guy's about to do it again. He is like the best storyteller I know. And he's, and he's just, he's just violent in his, uh, how much he pushes something. And he did this with, he looks like Jesus. He looks like a mix between Jesus and the guy from Silicon Valley, the show. (laughs) (laughs) He he did this in 2018 and 2019 with Bitcoin. Do you remember all those Bitcoin charts? And he's like, Bitcoin's going to become money and like all, all this stuff. And every day he would just hammer it on Twitter. I was like, oh my God, he's about to do it. And I didn't buy it and that's an adx miss so you know what look uh i think you always this is why re-underwriting your thesis is so important irrespective of whether you bought it or not and i really pushed this particular person on why he wouldn't buy spx even if it had run up i'm like if you truly believe this has potential you're not buying this to go yeah. to the incremental 30 percent. if you want 30 percent, buy safe stuff you're fundamentally believing this can do with 10x you either believe in this today or you don't if you don't get the fuck out Seriously, it just comes down to that. You either believe GOAT can reach Tao's valuation or not. That's like the bet you're making. And I think it's really important to know the game you're playing. Like these, if if Solana does well, or if 
no liquidity has entered the system. So in one scenario, there's no liquidity that comes into crypto. It's all PVP. There's this slosh of money. It becomes really hard, really choppy. Okay. But if you are structurally long, you get over the hump of the election, you believe next year is going to be good. There's more liquidity into the system. Then all you have to do is re-underwrite the thesis is, will coin X un outperform the benchmark, which is in this case, Solana or Ethereum or Bitcoin. And if it is, then look at it objectively like that. Oh, I looked at it at 50 million and it's at 600 million now. Oh my God, I'm an idiot. I'm like, no, you're an idiot for not believing that re-underwriting that if it has strength, like there's actually from a risk adjusted perspective, you could argue that a meme that once surpassed like and broke out from 200 range into 500, it's like, it's going to a billion. Once it goes to a billion, like it has staying power. It has a drawdown, like, and it rebounded. Like there, there's a lot of like really... There's, there's, I would argue it's a better investment from a risk adjusted perspective than in there. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, you have to re-underwrite these things. Right. And so, um, position sizing and, and, and buying throughout the process becomes important, I think. Yeah. Scale is the blockchain that is simply built different. Let's face it, other L1 networks have costly transaction fees that increase as the network gets busier. Scale has solved this problem with a gas-free, scalable infrastructure where users never pay gas fees. Scale was awarded the most active gaming chain in 2023 by CoinGecko and hosts five of the top 25 games on DAP Radar. You should definitely check out Scale. I was using it the other day. It really is incredible to use. That's Scale, spelled with a K. Hit the link in the show notes or head on over to scale.space slash ecosystem to get started today. Let's face it, building on crowded L1s or expensive L2s is just not going to unlock the next generation of applications in crypto. That's where super containers come in, offering a completely new solution that transforms your development control. Imagine dedicated, customizable app spaces running on Supra's 500 KTPS layer one blockchain. You get complete control over gas tokens and fees with the freedom to use your own token, create local fee markets, or even go gasless. Scale on demand and build with better customization than app chains, all at a fraction of the cost. Plus, with multi-VM compatibility, you can easily deploy your EVM, Move, and SVM smart contracts. It's time to rescue your projects from the costs, complexities, and fragmentation of traditional solutions. Get notified when super containers are ready for builders at super.com slash containers. Should we talk about non-memes? <laughs> yes. Is there anything interesting happening? Uh, Kraken launched an L2 today. Um, right. Just finished recording with the founder of Inc. So Kraken launched an L2 called Inc. Um, probably the best mental model for this is uh, Coinbase launching Base uh, exactly a year ago. So Kraken launched an L2 called Inc. Um, they launched it on uh, the OP super chain. So there's a couple ways to build on Optimism. You can basically just fork OP mainnet and not give them anything. It's just free and open. You can fork OP mainnet, not share any revenue, not share any fees, um, but also not be interoperable with the other folks building on the super chain. So Kraken with the other option, they opted into the super chain, which means you split some of the sequencer revenue with, uh, with Optimism. Uh, it's also mm -hmm. what uh, Uniswap did with the Unichain. It's what uh, Coinbase did with Base. It's yeah. what uh, Sony did with their Sonium. It's what Mode has done. It's what Zora has done. So there's yeah. this, um, um, yeah, nice, like, here, actually, we, we built this whole super chain thing. Um, this whole super chain dashboard, actually, we can see it. It's optimism dot, uh, optimism dot blockworks research dot, uh, dot com. You can start to see, like, you've got Zora, OP mainnet, mode, base. We got to add Unichain, um, uh, Krakens, Inc. So, yeah, you can actually just see, like, the optimism. This is the mm -hmm. transaction count. These are the unique active addresses. So they're just starting to stack chains on the uh, on the super chain. So this is also, by the way, that uh, Arbitrum Orbit does this same thing too. Um, ZK Sync has this with Elastic Chains. Avalanche has this with Avalanche L1s. Cosmos has obviously been doing this for years. Um, but yeah, curious. I mean, maybe we can get away from the stacks for a second. What are you, what are your thoughts on? Uh, I think there's two ideas at hand here. This is so. This is two weeks after Uniswap launched Unichain. Curious to get your take on like 
just the plethora of L2s and these. I, you, you actually could call this an app chain, I think, as well. It's an application with a bunch of users now launching a chain. Um, we it's never like really talked about you. Yeah, it's like base. It's you know, it's it's also I would compare it to Unichain as well. You've got a front end thing with a bunch of users. You've got a thing with a wallet, uh, and then you've got a you've got a chain as well. So I'm curious how you think about this. How much of you think was informed by the fact that Coinbase launched Base and Kraken is going public and wants to have a component of this? Um, I think it probably gave them the confidence to do this, but I think that every single exchange and every I think every application and every centralized company that has trades in finance will eventually have a chain and not, not just crypto yeah. companies. I think that NASDAQ will have an L2. I think that BlackRock will have an L2. I think that- You tweeted about this, right? Yeah, I think that Robinhood will have an L2. All, all of these things will get a chain. It also makes sense, right? They're, they're, they're creating a safer experience for their users if they want to interact on chain as opposed to them leaving because they see, excuse me, all the withdrawals, right? then they just want to own the experience to say, no, you're coming to our chain. And they might yeah. offer some incentives and have greater retention or wallet share of that activity, which they're not. Like there, there's leakage, right, from an exchange, right? As soon as you see a user, you know, um, empty his wallet or or start moving funds from the exchange to off-chain, to on-chain, then you just know you're missing out on that revenue. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I, I think you're right. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I, your broader question around what do I think about the plethora of L2s? I mean, sort of inevitable, right? We've both been talking about it. It's, we're going to continue to see a proliferation of it. We had episodes talking about L3s, L4s, L5s with, uh, Stephen from Arbitrum. Um, we've had Jesse from the base team here. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to continue to expand the, the two questions that uh, I think we should talk about. One, what does that do to Ethereum, the base asset? And because people are calling it parasitic, I don't think it's parasitic. People are calling it, what is, what is the value accrual? We've, you know, so, so what does that do for ETH? Um, and would you be more interested in like maybe owning the L2 token versus ETH? I'm curious what you think about that relationship. Not just from an, I think we all agree it's kind of positive for the ecosystem, but just ETH as a base asset. Like, what do you think about that? What do I think for ETH as the base asset? Like no, all I these don't. L2s will do? Yeah, in a scenario where you continue to have L2 proliferation, you get more users and whatnot. But like, what does that do to, like, do, do you feel excited about owning ETH at that point or not so much? I, so, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, it's yeah. the same argument I said a year ago, right? Which, which my thinking hasn't really changed. It's only gotten a little worse, which is, you know, uh, a couple, uh, this is my super, I don't have the technical take that maybe a Kyle Samani does, or, you know, I don't have the, I haven't thought about it as in depth as some of these folks have. I have a really left bell curve, small brain take, which is you used to, if you had a thousand dollars, you wanted to buy Ethereum. It was, uh, all you had to do was buy Ethereum. Then mm -hmm. A year ago, it became, oh, maybe I'll allocate some to Ethereum, some to Optimism, some to Arbitrum. Uh, and now it's like, okay, do I buy Ink token? Do I buy Base token? Do I buy Optimism? Do I buy Arbitrum? Do I buy ZK Sync? Like, do I buy the L2s on top of it? Do I buy the like uh, uh, Maker and Aave and Uniswap tokens on top of on top of Ethereum? Like, mm -hmm. uh, I actually just think it fragments the... You've seen that picture of the wallet. Precision. 10 different versions of USDC and you're like... Uh... Like you just imagine a user that is new to crypto, even even has been around for a while, be like, ah, yeah. what is this? Here, here's the here's the counter argument. It's just like ETH. My gut says ETH is going to rip in the relatively near future. That's the that's my, that's what my gut says. My the counter argument is uh, a for the sake of being a contrarian. Buy now, invest later. Druckenmiller told me to buy ETH, so I'm buying ETH. And uh, no, I'm actually not buying ETH right now. But um, I don't know. It just feels like you've seen this in crypto. It's like when something is the yeah, most. When someone, it's a mean reversion of the mean. Like it's totally out of favor. The pendulum of it's, it's just flat. so hated. Like you haven't seen an asset this hated in a long time. Like I, I saw Merge. But what? I, I saw it's a $300 billion asset. Like it's not cheap. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. I saw Mert tweeted out that like, 
Oh, this. Um, no, no, where was it? Ba- basically, Mert tweeted out the same. He copy pa- pasted a Ryan Sean Adams tweet. I like to do from, that. <laughs> and Mert was like, uh, "Crypto needs Ethereum. If if, if Ethereum is not a trillion dollars, like what is crypto? Something like that." It's a tweet that Ryan had tweeted out, and Mert got more likes than Ryan did. And mm-hmm. Ryan's just bull posting Ethereum to his audience who loves Ethereum. So I was like, okay, if Mert is getting more likes on an Ethereum tweet than than Ryan Sean Adams is, like, I mean, it's just it's a pretty hated it's a pretty hated asset. Now on the other side, you've got things like this happening, which is. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is the real economic value of Solana. Um, by the way, if anyone wants to see these metrics, Solana dot blockworksresearch dot com. Uh, I mean, this this chart is a pretty beautiful looking chart. So. Yeah. I mean, okay. The the second question is, um, do you think that at some point the interaction between these what seems today fragmented experience will will be able to develop connectivity tissue middleware that really improves the user experience. It makes it almost invisible where you just, um, you have routers as if in the same way that you had relayers facilitate just, you know, the smoothest experience. And when I say that it's, it's really just taking the perspective of the user, like will a user interacting through a wallet be able to, um, you know, not even have a, have the same experience that you get in Solana, like the integrated experience, which is you just have one ass. You don't think about any of these things that we're talking about right now. Like, do you think we'll ever get there? Or do you think that there's really kind of no incentive and we're just going to be in this L2 war where there's these big groups like Optimism, Arbitrum that are just trying to fight and they don't have no incentive to kind of collaborate with each other? So that's a really good point. Um, the front ends are going to do everything. All right, there's a couple things inside of that. One is the front ends are going to do everything they can to give you access to every single thing, like where where you're basically abstracting all of that stuff away. And if you look at like the chain abstraction stack, and you lo- you actually play with some of these apps, like I met with the founder of uh, Rally yesterday. They used to be f- or they used to be Floor, now they're Rally. Super clean. Like you as a user have no idea what you're interacting with. So mm. that's the first thing. The front ends are going to do everything they can. The second is, um, you know, I asked the Inc. founder, are you guys interoperable with Base? And they they consciously decided to be interoperable with Base. Oh. And I think that's a cool, yeah, I think that's a cool thing. That However, I think a danger, a dangerous thing that's happening right now is that these stacks, like Arbitrum, Orbit, or ZK Elastic Chains or Avalanche L1s, they're all interoperable with each other or with, with the apps inside of there, the chains inside of there. So like Base is interoperable with Unichain, which is interoperable with Kraken, which is interoperable with Mode, with Zora, with OP Mainnet, but they can't talk to anything outside of OP, right? So the dangerous thing is I think the network effects are going to get super fast, super strong, uh, super fast, super strong, um, super, excuse me, super strong, super fast, uh, inside of these stacks. So like the super chain, I don't know. It kind of depends on, I'm not, I'm not technical enough to understand, like, can the super chain things being built on the super chain interact with things being built in Arbitrum? i pro- probably they should be right. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, um, Yeah, I fundamentally just think that the experience might take a while. It's more of an uphill battle, and uh, that's the that, that's the dangers. These things creating these walled gardens it probably, inside. It probably will. It, it probably will in the same way that you know you, you know there, there's going to be built connectivity tissue between these chains and interoperability. I don't think you need the buying of these chains because it's open source. There might be just a, a independent company that says there's a lot of value for me to create interoperability within these chains and I can capture some of that value. Um, in the same way that you have services, bridges that allow you to move in between the L1 and the L2 and kind of, you know, you can pay up to use a particular bridge that might settle it faster, right? Because you need to move the money yeah. really fast. But, so I think that the connectivity 
is going to be there. The interoperability, we might get to a point where it's asymptotically really close to what an integrated experience like Solana provides. But I just think that in this moment in time, it's not that. And so I just, I'm not, I'm not, when I have something that is working today, I'd rather kind of double down on that and then just kind of wait and see. And I think most investors are in that kind of state. We haven't really talked about the ETF here, but I don't know. I'm sort of taking the extreme bar barbell approach, Bitcoin on one side, fastest horse on the other side, which is Solana, and then stuff that I like happening in Solana as a levered bets on that ecosystem. That's kind of how I'm approaching portfolio construction. Uh, like at the yeah. moment, if I redraw, I redraw it from scratch. Yeah. Um, there's all these chains launching. There's also all these token la tokens launching. Um, yes. There, there's a new thing happening, which is talking to some of the founders who are launching these things. They are trying to launch them at FDVs. They want to launch them at FDVs that are actually lower like not as low as possible because you could launch it low, but like they want to launch it low FDVs mm. um, so that their community and their users can actually make money on the way up because that seems to be the proven strategy, right? It's very different than like the strategy of the last couple of years, which is just valuation maximization, like launch it as high of an FDV as possible. There's, there's reasons why you can't launch super low. Like, you know, the VCs have expectations. Um, the, you have only so much control as a founder, right? You like the you know, Binance kind of sets the price these days. The market makers yeah. kind of set the price these days. So you only have so much control. But um, I don't know. How would you, if a founder came to you and was like, hey, I raised it like 500 million my last round. Um, should, should I try to get like a several billion dollar FTV or should I try to do like a low, as low of an FTV as possible? I don't know if you've thought about this much. I don't get involved in that decision historically so it's difficult for me to like tell you from experience like how that pricing works my appreciation was like so you approach a centralized exchange so like if you're going the centralized exchange route there's the negotiation with them i guess to set the price um like squirrel for instance just launched yeah. and they gave a certain percentage of the supply to binance because you know as a distribution partner and the same way that you would pay like i guess uh, every, everybody has to everyone yeah, Binance is now asking to. like two to ten percent of your tokens yeah it's, it's pretty crazy yeah. uh, but hey you know they're like the jp morgan of the space uh, and but it's difficult i as an investor i'm like well like i get the point of like not pricing it too high it's almost like pricing an ipo right uh, it's it's yeah. art, it's science. It also yeah. depends on so many things you can't control, like market conditions. Um, but yeah, there's some truth, I guess, in not trying to go and price it to the absolute maximum that you can get and leaving some room for new investors to like have a good experience out of the gate. <laughs> you know, uh, I think there's some truth to that. I think just this is how IPOs are priced as well, right? You, uh, you know, I think when Facebook IPO, it like rallied dramatically the first day it was like up like even coinbase as well and so the question always there is like what happened did investment bankers do a really bad job to price this thing was the company underselling themselves like and sometimes you go back to the range right and sometimes they really modify this range based on demand as they hit the market so the market's like not super efficient so yeah this is the problem with crypto it's like how much can you the question is i don't know i actually would love a founder to come in that's gone through this process like how much can you actually control i think that the the, the I, think, I guess you could signal to the exchange, like, hey, listen, I don't want to go at 10. I want to go at 5. So you're coming. And the exchange says, okay, fine. Um, but then you're diluting yourself more. So I don't know. There is something to be said about, like, how recent was the last round and who invested in that round? Was it institutional? Was it just... Uh... So I, I think there's some signal yeah. around um you have a view on it by the way i mean i, I don't know like no i don't have a view because there's there's all the no i don't have a view it's just, i just have a view that it's gonna be I, interesting to watch i don't know how the sausage making works in terms of the pricing because there's also a narrative thing of like oh my god that like there used to be a narrative thing at least that is like oh wow the ftv is way lower than people thought like bearish on this thing so there's by the way most people don't care about ftv in a bull market uh, they care about yeah. now but it's it's difficult it's, it's it, looking at ftv is also tricky because you have to look at the inflation curve are they giving all out emissions on the first three years, or is it like a file coin type of emission schedule that's like literally like hundred hundred years? Yeah, it's very different, yeah. right? 
you got to look at like emissions year one, three, five, ten at perpetuity. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then we can wrap, is the Stripe acquisition of Bridge. Yes, sir. Um, uh, one point one billion dollar acquisition. I think the biggest crypto acquisition in the industry ever. Um, there was the Galaxy. The other ones that came to mind were Galaxy, Galaxy BitGo at one point two billion, but that deal fell apart. Oh, um, there was Coinbase buying Polon or Circle buying Poloniex for four hundred million. Right. Uh, Coinbase bought Balaji's company Earn for what one twenty. Um, Binance mm -hmm. bought Coin Market Cap. The reported number was four hundred million. I heard that was a gross over exaggeration, mm. um, but I think it's the I think it's the biggest acquisition actually. Whether it's the biggest or not, it's the most impactful. Let's put it that way. It's the most impactful, yeah. Um, I've heard rumors that it has now forced the hand of a lot of other payment processors and financial institutions who are now starting to say, "Crap, we need a crypto strategy." Um, mm -hmm. and I don't think this is the crypto strategy of 2021 of in 2022, where, you know, they needed, they needed to launch NFTs if you were Starbucks to like, look like you were cool. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's that they need to offer their customers some, a crypto, a crypto technology. So this yeah. was a, a, I mean, a very bold move. Um, I, I, I got some, some of the story of how it actually happened behind the scenes and the, TLDR is it sounds like Zach from Bridge um, is, you know, just an amazing at selling his company. And it sounds like Patrick Collison basically just went not to overuse this term, but just founder mode. And listen, uh, listen to the, what he tweeted. Patrick Collison tweets, stable coins are room temperature superconductors for financial services. I'll say that again. Stable coins are room temperature superconductors for financial services. Thanks to stablecoins, businesses around the world will benefit from significant speed, coverage, and cost improvements in the coming years. Stripe is going to build the world's best stablecoin infrastructure. And to that end, we are delighted to welcome stablecoin, meaning that's a Twitter account of Bridge, to Stripe. Right. That's probably one of the best tweets I've seen. And you can guess that that tweet is in my deck. <laughs> So the context, the beginning of the year, there were these Chinese labs working on replicating something called LK99. Uh, they th were thought to have found a room temperature superconductor, which is this groundbreaking idea because of this like Holy enormous God. potential to change every industry. So room temperature superconductor, that comparison is, um, I just thought beautifully put. And what it sounds like behind the scenes is that you know, the, it sounds like Stripe was like, yeah, should we do it? Should, should we not? And Patrick Collison just said, stable coins are one of the most important things. They're here they to are. stay. It's a, again, a build versus buy conversation. With, I've been speaking with the bridge team because they become important partners, right? To implement in the companies that I go and acquire. And it's fascinating what they're doing under the hood. If you're a company that, that is settling, paying internationally, you have employees worldwide. It's like a no-brainer. Yeah. And that's yeah. the thing, right? There's this whole universe and part of crypto that people outside of crypto don't appreciate unless you're using it. But very few people are using it because they're distracted in this noise that crypto is just a casino. But like stable coins and anyone that runs a business understands the amount of friction that they have when they for payment processing, chargebacks. That's right. Sure, because payment failure. That alone is like in the hundreds and billions of dollars of friction. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Seriously. I am obsessed with removing friction from a system. And as simple as it may sound, it is a huge problem. The thesis is very simple. And I'll just leave you with this. This friction cannot go away until and unless you use crypto. Stripe has built a super successful business to facilitate you know, payments APIs and make that backend of payment rails faster, better, cheaper. They've been very successful at it. There's one area where they haven't been able to crack and it's 
it's this idea of, of, of using the traditional financial rails. It's very expensive. It's an antiquated patchwork. They came to this realization, I'm convinced, that in order for them to get to the next leg of growth and become, continue to be the leader, they needed to use stable coins because it is faster, better, cheaper. It removes the friction that they haven't been able to do. And that's honestly, that if that's one liner, that's like, that's the super, super bullish case on crypto. Yeah. That's yeah. a more interesting part of it too. It's like, we talk about these grandiose ideas. It's like, no man, like crypto is really good today, not in 10 years, like today it is working. <laughs> and I think to your point, everyone now is going to wake up and everyone like they were talking about how profitable Tether was. They're not going to say, wait a minute, I'm at a very competitive disadvantage because Stripe already is moving this direction and yeah. BlackRock's already moving this direction. And so I think it's, to your point, it's very different than a Starbucks announcing that they're going to do NFTs. Yeah. Like 100%. it is real for real this time. <laughs> oh, real. Yeah. Um, cool. It's a good place to wrap. Um, yes. Digital Asset Summit just went live. We've got like 30 or 40 speakers confirmed already. There's an open call to speakers for the next week. That shuts down November 1st. If you want your founder or you are a financial institution, you want an exec or a hedge fund and you want to come speak, mm -hmm. uh, there's yeah. a thing on the website. Google Digital Asset Summit Blockworks 2025. The page should show up. Call to speakers button on the right-hand side. In New York, right? Uh, in New York, yeah, yeah. There's um, we have outgrown most of the venues. It is now um, there's a brand, so there's Javits Center, which is actually just this like massive, annoying. Well, I'll be picking up my marathon number next next week. Yeah, sure. it's like a it's like a really big. It's like honestly like meh reputation, but they have this beautiful brand new section of Javits, and it's at this it's at nice. the brand new section of Javits. It's gonna be amazing. Okay, now, I don't so. need any convincing. It's in New York, man. Favorite city in the world. So. By the way, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening and you're running the New York Marathon, drop us a comment. I'll be there. Yano's coming out to support me with a huge banner because I'll need it because I've been injured and not running, but I'll half-ass it. And anyways, if anyone wants to run at a pace, drop your pace. Maybe I'll just we can do like a run group and like do a do a nice nice little marathon run. What's your What's your goal? Uh, I'm not gonna PR, dude. I I did a, a um with a really good friend of mine. Um, I did the Amsterdam half marathon. I hadn't ran in like three months because I was injured in my heel, but I felt pretty good because I've been cycling a lot. I think I will realistically run like at um three hours between three and three thirty. So Scroll. obviously not my Scroll. PR, but you know, punchy enough to feel like it was a workout. I mean, it's always a workout, but also yeah. I want to. It's so liberating that I'm not thinking about a time. There's the yeah. pressure's off. What's your really, what's the, what's the fastest you've ever run a marathon? Two forty seven, two two hours forty seven minutes eighteen seconds. London marathon last year. Then I ran Berlin two hours forty seven, thirty six seconds. Oh damn! And New York was like two hours forty seven, fifty eight seconds. That's crazy. Like all, That's nuts. That's nuts. Two hours forty seven. I'm not gonna do that this year because I've ran Tokyo, yeah. Boston, and I was injured. No excuses. This is going to be a fun run. So if anyone's down to run, you know, at a, that sort of pace range, drop me a note. We'll coordinate. Let's go. What's your, do you know your bib number yet? No, I don't. But uh, maybe I can post that. People can follow me. Just cool. put yeah, pressure. Follow along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Everyone's> like, ah. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you have okay. a great rest of the Friday. Great weekend. And uh, we'll see you Tuesday. We have, um, the Kraken episode, Kraken L2 episode coming out on Tuesday. Then the week after, we have a really interesting episode with the head of old head of comms at Solana and the head of the CMO of Celestia, um, which was like a deep dive into crypto marketing. So oh, subscribe to the show. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. All right. See you, folks. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching today's episode. Just wanted to quickly thank today's title sponsor, Scale. Scale really is one of the best chain experiences out there today. And I've used so many different chains. There's a reason they are gaining so much adoption in both gaming and AI use cases. Hit the link in the show notes to explore the Scale ecosystem.